Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We have a really exciting presentation with Coho, who is a new client of Adelaide's and just made a very exciting acquisition of Purebred, which is one of my personal favorites. I live very close to two locations, so it's extremely dangerous for me. <laughs> but for those of you on the East Coast that aren't familiar with the brand, uh, I think you're gonna find it really exciting and like nothing we actually have on the East Coast. Um, enough about me blathering on about purebred. A couple of housekeeping items. As you know, this uh, webinar does contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can find them on the company's uh, presentation on their website, which has been up updated to this version. Uh, and there will be a Q&A section at the end, so feel free to enter your questions in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll get to those. With that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Barnes, CEO, and Amrit Maharaj, COO of Coho. Hi, gentlemen. Hi, thanks for having us today. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Really excited to get to know um, both of you as well as what you're planning to do with this business combination. Uh, maybe to start, you could just give us a bit of a brief background about each of yourselves. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Andrew Barnes. I'm the CEO of the business. Uh, we started this company five years ago, uh, and we'll go through a little bit about what we do and how this acquisition comes together. Previous to this world, I worked at Electronic Arts for 17 years and had the opportunity to work in many different departments around the world um, in senior management, primarily focused on financial and operations. Uh, so uh, hopefully being, bringing a really strong backbone to be able to lead a large organization into the future. Amrit. Thank you, Andrew. My name is Amrit Maharaj. I am the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder with Andrew Barnes. I come from real estate development, so our family business for the past 40 years, and including significantly multifamily residential. So I've been able to learn the ins and outs of growing and building and constructing. So I handle the growth strategy and development side of Coho. So actually building up the facilities, family partnerships, but also dealing with the investment side with PR and investor relations. Okay, great. Well, I think, Andrew, you're going to be directing most of the uh, presentation, but Amrit, just as a heads up, you were a little bit quiet. So for the questions and parts that you may answer, you might want to just jam that mic a little bit higher. Um, but yeah, with that out of the way, Andrew, why don't you walk us through uh, through the merger and a little bit about each business and, and why you think this combination is super exciting? Absolutely. Yeah, this is a very exciting time for our company um, and a uh, very exciting time for an investor of this company. Uh, we are growing fast and have been, um, but we are gonna, going to be able to supercharge our growth based on this business combination. So we view these two businesses as highly aligned brands um, that will really be able to accelerate the growth and profitability of the combined company. To talk a little bit about both sides, Coho primarily focuses on um, our shared kitchen business. That's how we started. Um, so shared kitchens, meaning that we operate uh, large scale commercial kitchens and then rent those out uh, to food producers. And then we really help to showcase those brands and help them grow. Our mission is to supercharge food businesses across Canada, and this acquisition is in directly in alignment with that goal. Uh, we also operate a few retail locations on the front of our uh, main production facilities, um, and we are hoping from this acquisition uh, that they can help strengthen that retail presence for our business as well. Uh, we have been growing fast. We have a 59% three-year uh, CAGR, uh, and we are growing fast, and the wait list is significant. Uh, so we have about 150 member companies operating in their spaces right now, uh, and we have about 500 in the uh, in BC alone waiting to enter uh, our facilities. Uh, and we also have a significant demand across the rest of Canada uh, when we've gone out and um, surveyed the market. Um, one thing that we're mostly proud about is that members stay with us. They are, feel very strong about the experience that they have working in the Coho facility, uh, and we're able to help grow their businesses, which again is our goal. Uh, Purebred themselves um, are a tremendously successful and profitable business. So they are a coffee, ho a coffee house and bakery uh, who are now netting over $10 million in annual revenue uh, at a very impressive $1.7 million EBITDA. Uh, which within this space is um, definitely a market leader. 
they currently have six operating lo locations across uh, BC, um, but the really exciting news is that within a few weeks that they are launching their Vancouver Airport location, which will be their largest location to date, uh, and will really help accelerate that business. Uh, the two businesses make sense together. Uh, as I talked about, we pr primarily focus around production facilities and a little bit of retail, and they are the exact opposite. They have uh, very strong retail presence, uh, and but they do operate out of central production facilities as well. We believe that there's a huge opportunity in co-location as far as when we're growing out into Calgary, into Toronto and, and beyond, uh, that they will require production facilities that Coho will be able to support. And similarly, we will always require retail locations to get those um, amazing products to our customers. Uh, in addition, we believe that there's a great opportunity in B2B. We live, we live at Coho in B2B and we have a huge amount of opportunities and partnerships uh, with large companies that we believe that uh, Purebred will be a perfect fit for to help them get that product um, on, the, on those shelves. Of course, we have opportunities across our leadership teams as well, um, where we'll be able to consolidate uh, and, and find some synergies. But the primary focus is drive that top line revenue while also maintaining the amazing margin that they've already achieved. The team is very strong um, on, uh, on both sides, I hope. Uh, so uh, from the Coho angle, um, we Amrit and I just introduced uh, ourselves. We are supported by a very strong uh, CFO who comes from the public market realm as well, uh, working in cannabis previously. Uh, and Jennifer Chan drives all of our revenue generating activities and really focuses on getting those sales and getting our facilities full. Um, the Mark and Paula, Mark and Paula Lamming were the owners, are the owners of the purebred brand and have built it for the last 15 years. And they built something truly special, not only in the products they serve, but the teams that represent them. So uh, Lois, Emma, and Debbie below manage all the day-to-day -day -day right now and are able to scale and are ready to do so. We are, of course, supported by an awesome board of directors as well, just to talk to you a little bit about how they came to our ecosystem and what they offer. So Justin Morell is the COO of the Top Table Restaurant Group. Um, the Aquilini Investment Group uh, uh, are major investors in the Coho story, uh, and Justin joins from that side of the world. So Justin has built um, restaurant chains and cafe chains uh, across North America, including working with Tom Colicchio in New York, and is a real um, source of uh, wisdom on how we're growing out that business and really making sure that we achieve the high level of quality that the customers expect. Yuri Fulmer, uh, in a very similar vein, um, owns the majority of Western Canada's A&W locations, so is able to deliver at scale and build out large-scale food businesses, um, which, of course, is something that we're looking to do with the Purebred brand. And then finally, Alex uh, is the CFO of Enthusiast Gaming, and just a few years ago took that company from the Venture Exchange all the way to the NASDAQ. Uh, so obviously, having done everything that we hope to do in the next few years um, and having him on his board and uh, chair of our audit committee um, provides us that financial backbone that we really rely on. If you don't know the Coho story yet, what we do is we operate shared kitchens. You may have heard about these as ghost kitchens or commissary kitchens, and really they're all the same thing. What they are is off-premise locations, central production facilities that we build out and then rent out to our food producers themselves. Um, in the last three years, meal delivery has picked up and it has not uh, waned even after the big uh, surge after the uh, COVID period. Um, what we set ourselves apart a little bit, though, is we are not primarily focused on delivery only restaurants coming out of our facilities. We have over seven different segments within our kitchens uh, that could be caterers, packaged goods, packaged goods manufacturers, uh, restaurants doing central production, and a variety of other things. It really just provides us that diversity. So when one a part of the food industry potentially could be going through some challenges, people pivot and find success in other places. It really allows these companies to lower the barrier of entry, get started within almost a two week period um, and really protect their capital as they are able to grow. 
Uh, as I talked about, we are Canada's fastest growing shared kitchen company. Uh, we have a very strong margin that we operate the business as we're primarily focused on, on the, the walls around the facility and providing amazing services that um, help those companies grow. We have spent the last year with our heads down opening a lot of locations. So we had three locations at our IPO. We currently have nine locations, so we've more than tripled. Um, and these are large scale um, uh, development build outs. Uh, we are filling those locations fast as well. We just announced two new locations opening in Vancouver and they filled, and sorry, and they were 100% capacity when we opened the doors. But we're not stopping there. We're also looking at reducing costs, of course, as well to make sure that we're managing a very strong um, and profitable business. We retain our customers and we are very proud that the customers that work within us, um, within, within our teams, um, are the main evangelizers of our products. Um, and really, we are able to do rarely, fairly limited marketing uh, in order to drive that huge wait list that we have um, just because of word of mouth. It's, a, again, another thing that builds a beautiful community, uh, but also keeps costs down at the same time. Within this market, there's a bunch of players. It's a blue sky market right now. There's a lot of people growing um, and there's a lot of opportunity out there. The main two competitors that I'll talk about are Cloud Kitchens and Kitchen United. Cloud Kitchens was started by the former founder of Uber, uh, Travis Kalanick, uh, and they've raised a significant amount of money and they're growing in the United States and Europe primarily. They are focused primarily on the restaurant brands uh, and that traditional ghost kitchen model. So similar to what we do, but not directly in alignment. Uh, Kitchen United uh, similarly has raised a bunch of money from a national grocer in the United States, uh, and they are co-locating in grocery chains again to get that delivery network out there. So still operating in that space as a service game, but not directly competing with us as far as supporting all ranges of food businesses as, as they're able to scale. One of the questions that often comes up is, who are these companies? Are they, are they small little companies that um, produce too much risk for you? And absolutely not. These companies are all signing multiple year leases with us uh, and are scaling in the businesses. The, our primary next customer that joins our kitchen are the people that have been operating in our kitchens for years already. Um, with this chart, you'll see that some of the biggest brands uh, across North America have started from a similar situation. They're doing R&D. They're really building that relationship with their customer prior to making that big investment to go big. So you can imagine not only is that confidence in we have very strong members operating in our spaces, but also we can keep a very close eye on who those people are. And it's a future opportunity for investment for the business and, uh, and, our, invest in, and our investor community um, alike. Purebred. So Purebred, if you are familiar uh, with this brand, if you are located in Vancouver, you know this brand and you know why they are so good. Uh, they deliver amazing, unparalleled um, uh, excellence at each of their locations themselves. That YVR location is going to be very important for them as they're scaling out, but they've also signed LOIs at a number of other locations as well. So they're already built to scale and grow. Uh, we're just going to help supercharge that growth. Uh, just to take you through a little bit of a history and, and why we also believe it's so well aligned. They started as a farmer's market vendor. Uh, they said that if Coho had been around at the time in 2008, that's where they would have started. They wouldn't have taken that first risk of uh, a, a small production facility of their own, and it would have saved them a lot of time and stress. Um, but they quickly opened a couple Whistler locations. If you are familiar with Whistler, um, our local ski um, resort, uh, they that's their most profitable location. Um, it often has lines uh, out the door that you can stand half an hour, 45 minutes to wait to get your delicious baked croissant. Um, and that is something that they were able to take that quality and then replicate that out many places around the city, which I'll go into a little bit later. 2018 was a very important time for them. What they decided to do was set up a central production facility. They had no multiple locations already, uh, but they really wanted to make sure that they achieved the same quality at every single place, but of course, to drive that incredible margin that they have. Uh, so that is an area that they allowed them to scale and really is indicative, and we'll get to the numbers. That's when things start getting really interesting from the purebred side and really allow them to grow uh, into the future. 
that production facility is currently at 50%, 50% capacity, meaning that we can double the amount of stores in the lower mainland with no additional cost in the, on the production space. There's a huge opportunity for this. They've de developed a huge brand following. So of course in BC, but beyond as Deborah, you were mentioning, there's nothing like this in the rest of the country. We have the opportunity to get there and, and grow. The locations themselves are split between the Sea to Sky Corridor, um, so Squamish and Whistler, uh, and in uh, downtown Vancouver. Uh, both, the, all of these locations, sorry, are uh, profitable locations. All of them uh, have a huge following. And when a purebred enters a new market, the community gets super excited about it. Uh, so within uh, the airport, uh, why they decide to get the airport, we'll, we'll get to the next slide. Um, they're going to capture everybody before they even get to Vancouver and really build that um, relationship um, as they're as they're creating that. One of the interesting things here is that many of these locations were previous cafes that were not able to meet the expectations um, that uh, or the the quality level that purebred has been able to achieve. That allows for uh, purebred to move in. Uh, transition to new ownership effectively and move fast and be very profitable in the in the same time. Uh, as I talked about, they are uh, growing very quickly. So even without this injection of um, of of growth that we're talking about here, uh, they have doubled their revenue uh, between 2021 and how they'll uh, finish the end of the year. And this is without any additional revenue streams that we are talking about as far as new locations coming online or really driving their B2B market. Um, so we, the, this, sorry, this is what they're able to do in an organic way. Imagine what we can do when we have a very strong strategy to help grow out this business. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Starbucks. So Starbucks has opened, uh, sorry, has closed uh, over 300 locations across Canada in the last few years. Why have they done that? It's because they're primarily focusing on that coffee experience and that grab and go style. So they're really prioritizing their locations um, that fit that model. It leaves a whole lot of locations that are in absolutely prime locations for food primary operations. And Purebred is entirely a food primary operation uh, where you can get some amazing coffee. Um, what's really nice about these is that they're perfectly built out as great cafes already. Uh, they just need to be rebranded as purebred. We need to spend a little bit of money to, uh, to make the experience feel the same as every other purebred location, and then almost immediately start revenue uh, generation from each of those locations. So about two to three months per location to go from a lease signing to opening the doors and starting to produce cash. That's what we're so excited about this business is they have an amazing product that's able to be re replicated quickly uh, and across the country at scale. Uh, best part about this is that there is no permits required. So if anybody on this call is familiar with the permitting uh, procedure in Canada, uh, that can absolutely kill you and, and add months, if not years, to, to your development plan. That's not a problem. We move into pre-permitted locations and move at speed. The Airport specifically, why are, again, why are we so excited about this? Uh, the airport has over 10,000 average daily travelers that are coming through that space. The previous uh, operator of this location, which is near the Bill Reed statue pre-security, if you're familiar with the Vancouver International Airport, um, was generating over $5 million in revenue alone. We've reduced that estimate slightly just to be a little conservative, uh, but they're currently um, projected to be open for almost twice as long of hours as the rest of the purebred locations and actually produce uh, more revenue than even expected after that. Um, so huge opportunity that we want to push within the airport itself. And if we're successful here, it really opens up the opportunity uh, for future um, locations in this airport, in other locations, and of course, in um, uh, high volume locations around the country. Uh, why are they so good? Um, this is what is really the at the end of the day, they rely on having amazing product and amazing staff, and that puts them uh, above everybody else. So I don't think we're surprised that they um, rank above the like international chains. That's not a terrible surprise. What might be surprising to some people is, if I go to the next slide, uh, is that they rank above every other local chain, uh, even the really high-end patisseries. 
um, in, in forms of absolutely everything. Their coffee is the best, the pastry is the best, their selection is the best, their customer service is the best. They rely on making sure that the quality and their people on the team really delivers that. Their marketing is very light. Uh, of course, they have Instagram channels and things like that, but they rely on crowdsourced information to generate that activity. Um, and that's, again, just rely on your, on your quality and allow you to grow. That's pure organic growth. And with our skill set of, of growth that we have behind us, uh, we can help supercharge that, um, that strategy. Um, just to finish on the overall quality experience between the two locations, uh, I do want to showcase what's happening on the right side of the screen here. If you haven't been into Purebred before, what you are going to expect when you walk through that door is a sensory overload. Uh, there's over 75 products that are on for sale every single day that are baked freshly that morning, totally different products. I dare you to go into the store and only pick one thing and walk out. It just doesn't happen. And that's also why they're able to be so successful. Um, they, what they call it is that Willy Wonka experience. You walk in there for a coffee and you end up with walking out with a 12 pack of various other things. Um, so it really works for them and their customers alike. How the companies make sense um, uh, together is very clear here as well. We have a similar amount of locations. Uh, we have a very similar amount of high reviewed services. Uh, we are really viewed highly from our retail experiences, but of course, from our customers that are operating in the space, they're beloved from their staff and from their customers alike. Uh, two cult followings on the support itself, um, and then a very strong management team to support both companies. Where we are going with this, this is the initial growth plan till the end of uh, 2026. Coho is, uh, has a very clear plan. We are growing uh, in Western Canada, of course, um, but we are definitely growing into the East as well. Uh, Toronto is our main target here. We currently have those uh, nine operating locations uh, and we are forecasting to, to double those amount of locations by uh, the end of 2026. Similarly, Purebred currently has, they will have seven locations by the end of next month. Um, and we are forecasting even more than doubling those locations to over 20 locations by the end of uh, that same period. How that revolves onto revenue is it takes a profitable business in July um, and into, into basically blue sky territory. We have huge opportunity ahead. Um, with this, and we're currently forecasting a $58 million revenue um, by the end of 2026, so more than tripling our revenue. Um, this is why I believe it's a great opportunity to get involved in the Coho and Purebred story now, um, because we are moving fast and uh, making sure that we focus on that profitable, sustainable growth um, that I believe that most investors are looking for today. I'm not going to go into these slides, but I'm happy to ask any questions around our cap structure um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, we valued this business at $10 million, um, which has come out in the, in the news release. The reason for that is not only because of their absolutely uh, powerful um, EBITDA numbers, um, but because they've been scaling significantly, again, doubling in revenue in the last couple of years, as well as we know that uh, where we're going to take them into the future. Uh, where we're especially excited about on this slide is that uh, debt support from BMO. Um, they are, to be a little bit transparent here, is that we were a number, there was five different vendors bidding for this. There was a lot of companies that wanted uh, to get involved in the purebred story. We are very proud of that. Similarly, when we took it to banks, um, banks were very excited about the story as well. So we had many suitors approaching us to try to get this. So we were able to get the best terms possible here and protect the dilution of our investors as we move forward. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. So I'm going to be happy to answer questions. But I, what, I want to, what I want to leave you with is that we have two very exciting businesses here. We have one shared kitchen business that's um, really growing out and supporting um, companies like Purebred to grow and become that next um, uh, household name of that business. And then when we have Purebred, who has really developed a beautiful community cult-like following project, product that started to scale, and we've uh, entered it right at that right time to help them to scale even further. So what we really believe in here is growth, sustainability, profitability, and national expansion. And that's what we're really going to hammer on. And we're going to be communicating back to the market regularly. So thank you, Deborah, for this opportunity and uh, happy to answer any questions. But um, I encourage you guys to keep a close eye on what's going on in Coho over the next few months because it's going to get very exciting.
I have a question, Andrew. Um, just wondering about how it looks with the com combined companies and the national growth opportunity. You touched on some of the synergies, but maybe you could delve a little bit deeper into how that looks as a combined company. Absolutely. So um, each of our locations um, average around 10 to 15,000 square feet of coho's locations. Those are primarily built as production facilities. Uh, the uh, purebred has their own production facility that's around 6,000 square feet. So as we go into the new markets, the first thing that we're going to do is subdivide our locations as we go and provide a base production facility in each of those regional markets to allow for that growth. So if we're putting a production facility into Toronto, we know that we're planning on adding an additional at least 10 stores uh, of the purebred when we, sorry, of purebred when we're growing and expanding into that. The other thing, thing is that we have uh, seven production facilities right now, two of which do have retail presences on them, five which don't. So we have an opportunity almost immediately to put a purebred retail presence on each of our existing locations to help drive um, that success as well as to just manage and support costs. Um, so definitely looking at that. Uh, and then uh, I think I mentioned before, but the networks that we have are um, quite considerable. Uh, purebred uh, haven't taken as much opportunity as they have about being able to sign those B2B contracts, work with the large scale customers and developers that we're already working with, um, that we have, I mean, as soon as we announced the deal, we got a lot of uh, feedback, as you can imagine, uh, from our suppliers, from um, our partners that want to be part of the purebred story. Um, so we're gonna be working carefully on identifying what are those right opportunities and chasing that down. Got it. And in terms of capacity, what capacity are your current locations at? Good question. So our uh, downtown Vancouver locations are above 100% capacity. How do I measure that? It's that uh, we just keep uh, finding new creative ways to get people into our spaces because um, uh, ultimately we don't want to turn anybody down. Uh, we have two locations that are um, out of downtown Vancouver, both in uh, Gibsons on the Sunshine Coast and one in Victoria. Uh, those have reached the point of profitability, um, but they're not full yet. We're building out new markets. Victoria opened in October, uh, Gibsons at the same time. Uh, we are pushing um, those to make sure that we meet the, the majority of, sorry, the, the biggest opportunity that we can. Uh, the other opportunity we have in Gibsons is that we have a beautiful restaurant on the front of one of the locations um, that is generating profit back into our business as well. And of course, as the um, as the summer season kicks off, um, our profitable business there will hopefully become um, a, a big impact uh, to Coho's bottom line. Sorry, that's a Coho owned restaurant or a partner owned restaurant. It's that's a partner owned restaurant, but we we get um, significant benefits when they succeed. Okay, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the benefits of being a partner and, and the things that you help provide for, for your partners and how that can also benefit um, purebred going forward. Yeah, very good question. So um, ultimately what we want to do and what I tell people when I take them on tours throughout the facility is that you need to provide three things by, prior to you coming and producing food in our facility. You need to sign a contract with us. You need to get insurance. Um, and you need to bring your food in. That's it. Everything else you can get started um, with the support and the systems that we have. As many people will know, um, the most risky time to start a food business is before you've opened your doors. The amount of time and risk that there is in building a facility and even just taking over an old facility and getting it repermitted um, is significant. And most companies run out of money before they even open the doors. We, have, of course, eliminate that risk all the time. They can start um, from a two week period. Um, uh, by the time you get through all that contractual and insurance things, it takes about two weeks. Uh, after that, you're off to the races. Um, once you're into the actual facilities themselves, what we often see is members popping up businesses all over the place, caterers that are suddenly also doing a, um, a meal delivery company. It's really exciting to see how um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, the people that are operating in our spaces uh, can be in getting the work done. Um, how does that actually translate? Uh, oh, sorry. The other thing is to re really provide them uh, business services. A lot of the people that operate in our uh, spaces are amazing um, artisans. They can deliver. Like it's, we have the best. We have the best job in the world because we get to walk around the kitchens and we get fed some amazing food. Um, amazing food, but necessary. But they need that business support. 
Uh, so we provide, for the lack of a better word, a, um, a board of directors that's consistent throughout all of that member experience. So we can provide them connections, wisdom, connections to finance, all sorts of things to help them grow. Uh, a lot of that effort and focus is around that marketing, really helping them build that brand message and really setting themselves apart from our other members, but also, of course, the rest of the market itself. Um, and I think that that part is where purebred can benefit the most from is that um, they haven't viewed, they have been growing organically. They haven't known what's an opportunity for them ahead. They don't know the opportunity necessarily that landlords might work with them uh, to get them better deals and get them to move faster. Um, they don't know the opportunity, what marketing could really do if you were able to kind of fuel a lot of, uh, put a little bit of cost behind that uh, to help that grow um, a whole lot stronger. Um, so it's been amazing that they built organically, um, but with the skill set um, that we have, one of one an, ex an interesting example here is that uh, we were talking with that team, and they were saying one of the challenges that they have is that you get when you walk through the door, you feel something at Purebred. It really is an overwhelming feeling of sense and and what you see and the happy faces around you, and that just doesn't translate as well um, into the the digital realm um, and in something that they haven't got on top of. Uh, we are also a very sensory business as well. We're in the food space, of course. Um, and it's something that I believe if you go to our Instagram, you'll really see the people, the quality, and you'll just get hungry looking at that stuff. Um, so that's something that we believe that we can really benefit them. And especially as we're entering to new markets, I think that that marketing muscle will require a lot more um, kind of support uh, than, than right now. If you open anywhere in Vancouver, it's not going to be a problem. You know who Purebred is and you're excited that they're coming into your community. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, plans and timeline for your national expansion? What provinces do you think you're going to go into and what sort of timeline um, do you see yep. that happening in? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, primary focus over the next few weeks is, of course, um, uh, the integration, um, starting to really learn about the business and the opportunities ahead. Um, there are expansions locally happening right now and ones that we're not even able to talk about because um, they haven't been fully signed, but there's there's future uh, growth here right now. Um, Amrit and myself are in Toronto over the next couple of days and we're starting to look at new locations already. So this is a immediate start thinking about this and start thinking about how we could scale that out. Um, in that deck, it talks about those 20 locations across uh, by 2026. That includes expansion into Toronto primarily. Uh, Calgary is an obvious one as well, because uh, that's something that's coming up for Coho too. And I had an audience question, which was, can you talk about debt and the cost of leasing at the airport? Ah, yeah, very good question. Uh, so, uh, so the cost of debt is entirely balanced on the uh, on the success of the purebred team. So they've built a very profitable business, and in that debt that we've been able to secure is 100% aligned to those finances. So there's actually quite a lot of room and quite a lot of comfort with the deal that we've signed. Um, I mean, BMO wouldn't uh, sign it at senior debt levels if they weren't confident at those those numbers. Uh, we did a full uh, quality of earnings report, so we feel very strong about the profitability and the cash flow that's coming through that uh, team. So the debt, to, to be frank, the debt servicing from that business um, is based on those six locations, and it's very strong already. As we have new locations coming on, uh, we it's it's only... Uh, more opportunity, of course, that we're going to be in a stronger financial position. Uh, the airport uh, cost of living is a, sorry, a cost of leasing uh, is a percentage of uh, revenue. So uh, really, everybody is incentivized to do um, uh, to do better there. So the airport marketing team is very excited about a local brand that they're going to be able to um, uh, talk about and, um, and, and market uh, within their community. Uh, but ultimately, um, the, there's no downside. Uh, it's only about growing that business out and, and meeting all of the opportunity that we can. And he had a follow-up question asking, what about percentage? Do you what, need... what specific percentage? I don't know. Um, maybe he could <laughs> uh, elaborate I, on that. The question and was, then... what, so I'll elaborate on what how the structure is. I'm not going to talk about the specific percentage um, because I'm actually not sure if that's something that uh, the airport is comfortable with. Oh, sure. he means interest rate, maybe. Oh, the interest rate on I the I don't airport. know. I'm not sure. It's unclear. But... Let me answer all of those questions <laughs> uh, and hopefully capture something there. Uh, so uh, 
how a percentage of rent works is that effectively every dollar that you uh, um, that you sell, a percentage of that dollar goes towards the rent. Uh, but if you don't sell uh, anything, then you don't pay any rent. Uh, that's why it's all entirely upside that you're you're both um, uh, incentivized in the same way to grow that story. Uh, first answer. I cannot at least at this time talk about that percentage of rent. I do not know if that's um, uh, if that's information that I'm allowed to share. But after this call, I'll go get uh, that information. So for further follow ups, that I'm uh, I'll be comfortable answering that question. Um, and then finally, uh, on the debt itself, it's senior debt level. So we're talking prime. It ranges um, on the on the variety of different securities that we have within that debt package. Um, but uh, the it's prime plus 0.85% up to prime plus 2%, um, uh, two, sorry, two basis points. So uh, that is something that we're pretty excited about is that the majority of that is covered at uh, prime plus 0.85, which is a very good rate to get in this market right now. Okay, and I had another audience question, which is, what happens to your margin profile when you add bricks or continue to add bricks and mortars to your existing model? Uh, good question. Um, so we, I mean, it's very positive. Uh, so the existing, um, oh, so sorry, to our existing business from the coho angle itself. Uh, right. Okay. So the coho's um, specific locations that are operating uh, are uh, operated at significantly good margin. So each of the locations themselves operate around a 30 to 40% uh, EBITDA margin. Um, and of course, supported by um, the, the strong management team that we have around it. But we have been focusing on growth, adding new locations, really capturing that wait list opportunity. Um, the and but that's also why we've been looking at like reducing our costs as much as possible because we haven't been in, in that strong profitable financial position the acquisition here makes us a strong profitable organization overnight uh and the opportunity moving forward is even even bigger right now purebred's able to um, achieve a 17 percent um ebitda with only a 50 percent um full production kitchen uh so they can add locations and add profit um, that will increase that margin uh, expectation overnight. Um, every single location that comes online at Coho and at Purebred strengthen that overall combined business. That's why we're pretty excited that they make sense together and they're able to move fast together as well. Do you need to raise capital or can you continue your natural growth path? Good question. I think we're going to do both. Uh, so uh, we are raising capital to close this transaction, of course. Um, and uh, provide a little bit of growth capital to uh, let it let it go. Uh, as I went through the financials of Purebred, you can do the math pretty quick. They're producing quite a lot of cash on a monthly basis, and it doesn't cost a lot of money to open these new locations. Um, so that is something that you can move from organic uh, growth. But if you were able to raise some additional cash, you could probably go even faster. Uh, from the coho side itself, um, it's the same story. The numbers are just bigger. Uh, so we are profitable, we're generating things, but we just it just kills us to see so many people sitting on the wait list with a, uh, a very clear product offering that we have um, that we could be able to do that. So that's why we look to raise cash on the coho side because uh, they're larger scale build outs. They are more profitable when then they're open, um, but it takes longer. Um, so the mix of those two, one being like this just center of cash growth um, that we're able to grow fast and one that is a, a center of, of uh, margin um, and, and also fits that original mission that we're doing, um, both fit very well, but they move at different speeds. Okay. And does Kitchen United or any of your other peers enter into these offsite ventures, i.e. purebred and other potential targets? Yep, good question. Uh, so uh, Kitchen United does. Kitchen United does play in the food space, um, in, in the production space itself. Um, the two that I didn't talk about on that um, on that slide that I went back up, and I can try to go back to, uh, is uh, Katopi um, and, um, well, Katopi, let's talk about that one. Uh, so that is a, a major European player um, and Middle East player. Uh, they do all of the production, the food themselves. So they are building brands themselves. Uh, they are also locating, they're co-locating businesses to operate in those spaces, um, uh, as well as producing foods, owning brands themselves and helping to build that out there. Ultimately, where we believe that we provide value is anywhere from 
all the way back to the farmer, all the way to the person eating the food. That's where we believe that there's a value chain that we have to support and want to support and can do better than is currently out there. Um, and there's a whole, and you can imagine the amount of touch points that are happening between that farmer and that end consumer is significant. And it's not easy. It's not easy to run a food business. It's expensive. Every There's a point taken at each one of those uh, stages. And the more that we can vertically integrate that system, we can support our businesses and our own uh, food businesses to help grow. So ultimately, we believe that this provides diversity into it. We believe that this provides um, uh, inspiration to the members that are operating into our spaces as well about how a farmer's market vendor can go from this all the way to the other side. Um, and of course, it provides opportunity for our members to help sell more products through those retail channels. Do you take shares at any of your partner companies or is that something that you've thought about? Uh, we do not yet, um, but we absolutely have thought about it and it's a future opportunity. Okay. And... How has the timing of the original corporate plan been changed or delayed? Uh, from what uh, the, the previous things that we've talked I'm about? I'm assuming from when you went public as Coho. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so in some ways, uh, it's accelerated. We've actually opened more locations, especially because we've been focusing on turnkey locations, um, meaning rather than building out from um, an empty warehouse. We're looking at taking over uh, warehouse. Uh, sorry, we're looking at taking over catering businesses, other food production facilities, things like that that allow it to uh, scale a whole lot faster. Um, but we have, of course, been also hit by delays on the construction side. Um, so permitting, permitting is the bane of everybody's um, uh, of existence, and that's really slowed us down as well. So there's been a couple of our major projects that we were expecting that would have been completed to date. A couple just opened in East Vancouver, as I was mentioning, so uh, I've gotten past there. So um, the demand uh, it remains really high. Um, a couple of those locations, unfortunately, were delayed, which has pushed, uh, slowed our plan down a little bit. But of course, with and that's where we get creative. If the plan slows down on the on the organic growth side, um, we should be looking for acquisitions to help grow that business out in the meantime. So this is the first of many acquisitions that uh, we're going to close on. Um, and uh, from an investor investing at the IPO, what I would say is that 20 million forecasted like annual run rate in July is uh, significantly higher than we are aiming to have at this time last year. Okay. And I had a question about major fears uh, about the government. I assume that would be permitting. Related. Uh, it might be a couple of things, actually, um, without understanding the full context of the question. Uh, yeah, permitting is always an issue, um, but that's going to be an issue for every business that you're operating. It just, make it, it just makes it harder in the food space specifically. Um, I think that they're probably talking about is that there's been certain regions out there that have uh, limited um, cloud kitchens and cloud kitchens specifically their growth. And the reason for that is because uh, you can imagine if you're operating 40 different um, uh, ghost kitchens in a specific location, the amount of impact that you can have on a local community is awesome. Like you can provide some amazing local food options. Um, but uh, I can tell you from our East Vancouver location, which we thankfully built to support that scale, um, the amount of uh, DoorDash, Uber Eats drivers and things like that can have a big uh, impact. So um, uh, other um, municipalities, for example, downtown Barcelona has said you cannot have cloud kitchens in, in those spaces because it just generates too much traffic. Thankfully, again, that's not our business. Our primary uh, business is supporting those food producers rather than that ghost kitchen um, delivery only network itself, as well as thankfully, as we've been building these new locations, we've seen those um, it's called jurisdictional issues come up and have uh, designed places around those problems. We have, uh, to be very clear, we have never had any problem uh, with um, local municipalities. Um, and actually, those lo local munici municipalities come to us uh, to say, please solve this problem because they are constantly getting uh, feedback from their producers saying there's nowhere to operate. The places that are there to operate are not safe or good places to, to produce within. Uh, I have this amazing idea. I need to grow it. Please help support me. And then they come to us to help uh, implement that. So it's almost the uh, opposite for us. But we also play a very uh, we have a very friendly relationship, so we're not going in to try to uh, entirely um, 
disrupts absolutely everything that's happening in a downtown core. We're trying to work with uh, developers. We're trying to work with our producers uh, to meet those goals. Um, and uh, we haven't had any issues in any of the locations that we operate. And just going back to the permitting um, issue, is one of the benefits of the Starbucks opportunity for you, the fact that the locations are already permitted? Yes. <laughs> Clear what, what kind of is, time yes, saving um, is that? <laughs> uh, yeah, just to give you an example, right? Like the uh, in the city of Vancouver, which is probably, and people might contest this on the phone, but probably the hardest market in all of Canada uh, to open locations. The permits can last literally a year just to go in from here's the permits to getting the receiving. That's not the building. That's just the permitting time alone. Um, and you can imagine if you don't have great um, relationships with your developers, which we thankfully do, but for small guys, it's really hard. You're sitting on a permit for a year, you're paying rent. How are you expected to be able to open and be successful afterwards? That can be very uh, limiting. We get around that at Coho's. Again, we're looking for um, turnkey facilities. We're looking for, um, uh, and we have some good relationships with the cities as well to help push that through. Uh, on Purebred, that's exactly the benefit. Uh, go into a, a facility that's pre-permitted pre to operate as a cafe, as a food uh, manufacturer. And the great thing there is that you, because of that production facility, it's really easy to find these spaces. Um, it's one thing if you have to go in and you have to find a kitchen that's got a cafe front, as well as like a bunch of ovens and venting in the back. That's not easy to find. Um, so all they're essentially looking for is retail outlets that they can move into. And thankfully, there's a lot out there and they um, deliver exceptional quality uh, better than the, the previous tenants. So move in there, start making money almost immediately. That's great. Um, as a small business about to embark on a massive growth endeavor, what are your major fears? Like, what do you think could um, potentially disrupt your business plans? That was an audience question, Andrew, not try to trip you up. No, no, no. no <laughs> you probably don't hear it in the background. There's just some drilling. So I did hear the question. I was just waiting to respond to that. Uh, so, I mean, the biggest fears, uh, I'll speak on both sides. Um, the biggest fears on the coho side is leaving opportunity on the table. Um, we have a lot of uh, companies um, and that just hurts us, of course, from an investor standpoint, it probably hurts that we're not bringing in more revenue and more profit. Uh, that hurts us. Uh, from a member's perspective, these are people that we tour around, we see the amazing product that they have and how this can impact their lives. Uh, and that's something that uh, is really challenging for us. Uh, from Purebred's uh, perspective, the main challenge is make sure that we grow at a rate that is, of course, um, meeting their opportunity from, from their financial angle, um, but grow at a rate that protects the quality of that brand. Um, so really learning and understanding exactly what has made them so powerful and, and how they've made that, like, um, that transition to a growth stage business in the last few years. Um, they've been operating for 15 years, but doubled their revenue over the last three years. Uh, so they are ready for that. And what are the things that are enabled them to do that while also holding up that quality? That's something that's going to keep us up at night is making sure that we treat that brand with respect, uh, let their teams grow into the areas that they believe because they know how to do it right. We just need to help them along that journey and give them a little bit of uh, added support to help meet those growth expectations. I think that's a good segue into the last question, actually. And Amrit, if you could put up the either the purebred revenue growth slide or the combined Either one I think would work. The last question is talking about revenue stream with Purebred and has it been accelerated and talking about quarterly results, but maybe you can just talk about the revenue acceleration in both businesses generally and how you get there. Uh, yes. So I guess the first thing uh, on a previous slide, but don't go there, uh, was uh, it showed that, um, I mean, we have tripled the amount of locations. We've showed a 60% revenue growth in Q3. Those locations are coming online uh, throughout the year. Um, so that's where the run rate is coming through. So Coho side is growing right now. And as we um, continue to release quarterly results, uh, we'll continue to show growth in that space as those more locations come along. Um, in a previous slide, we also showed that Purebred uh, went from a 6.6 .6 million revenue uh, in 2019 and is on a run rate to close um, uh, at nearly double uh, that number uh, from that period. 
Um, so that's how, how that gets there. Uh, and then the simple calculation we have for combined revenue forecast uh, is taking the existing locations uh, and uh, multiplying those out based on the conservative timelines that we've had on when we can add those locations in based on either our current roadmap, which is the, um, the coho side, uh, or based on the, the forward-looking uh, roadmap, which is, of course, what we're doing in this transaction itself. Uh, I can't go into quarterly results from Purebred. Uh, they were, haven't been a publicly uh, traded company, um, but they are a very strong, profitable business um, that uh, is going to marry very well with ours, and we're going to be a, a strong combined entity because of it. That's the last audience question, and you got through all of mine as well, so... I'm out of questions. Um, was there anything today that you wanted to talk about that you wanted to hit on with investors that we didn't get a chance to discuss? Uh, not, not directly. I think I just want to summarize what we're trying to do here. Uh, we believe in building and growing food businesses in Canada. We believe in building community. Uh, we believe that what we have been doing at Coho and what they have been doing at Purebred marries perfectly in that goal. Uh, we think the world needs more of both of these things. Um, so that's why we want to grow. That's why we want to raise money to, um, to help and impact more communities across Canada and then North America. So we are focused on that national growth. We are focused on that profitability to make sure that we can do so sustainably. Uh, and then we're focused on that quality to make sure that at the end of the day, we're unwavering in the products that we put out because that's going to win in the end. Okay. In terms of catalysts for investors to keep an eye out for, can you kind of run us through the next three, six months? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I think the obvious thing to keep a close eye out for is the uh, the airport location coming online. Uh, so we will definitely um, send out news. You're, well, there will be news. If you live in Vancouver, you'll, you'll see some PR uh, generating around that. Um, but as that comes out of the gates, uh, how that's performing and how we report on that, that's obviously going to be really important. Um, Coho has uh, other additional locations that are coming online, um, and as I alluded to before, um, there are um, there are business LOIs out there, not complete yet, so I don't feel comfortable sharing them um, on the purebred side, which will show uh, even added growth uh, in that pace alone. So, um, Coho again, I think that one of the questions is like. What are we doing and how are we communicating it? Uh, we've been so focused on that growth of that organic building that side. Um, one thing that I will recognize is that we need to do a better job telling all of the amazing things that we're doing in this community. Um, and thankfully, we are a new client of Adelaide. Um, so that's what we're really trying to do with that relationship is tell more people about the important work we're doing. Uh, and of course, why it's exciting to be an investor at this time. Okay, great. Anything from you, Amrit? No, I think we've done covered it and very grateful for everybody in this call and looking forward to sharing that adventure together. Yeah, great. Well, thank you both for taking the time to present and thanks to the audience for participating. As always, we will post this on our YouTube channel and push it out through social media. If anyone has any questions or would like to book a one-on-one -on -one call with management, feel free to reach out and yeah, everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.